Hello and welcome to the 2021 inaugural Australia and New Zealand Climate Tech 100. My name is Patrick Brothers, co-CEO of Holland AQ, and I'm joined today by Mick Lubinskis from Climate Salad. Hey, Patrick, how are you doing? Great to be here. Very excited. Good, mate. Thank you. Um, look, we're also going to be joined by five fantastic climate tech leaders, uh, four of whom are, are women leaders. So uh, we're really looking forward to that as part of the second part of today. Um, the chat is open as well, so please feel free to introduce yourself and um, tell us a little bit about um, what you're doing as well. Please be respectful um, in the chat as part of that as well. Many of you would have already picked up. Uh, we had promoted the ANZ Climate Tech 50 and um, without stealing our own thunder, um, there were so many incredible teams to pick from. We, we had to expand to the Climate Tech 100 for Australia and New Zealand. Um, so exciting news to, to get start, but let's, let's jump in um, here. This is a fast and furious action-packed 45 minutes. We are going to move really, really quickly. You're going to get a copy of the recording straight after this session to go back and follow things at a more sensible pace. First, um, we'll touch on the backstory of the Climate Tech 1000. Mick's going to share more about climate salad and what he's seeing in the Australian and New Zealand ecosystems. We're going to pause for one second to zoom out and look at a taxonomy and methodology around both the ANZ Climate Tech 100 and on the taxonomy that we're building for climate tech globally. The most exciting bit, as I mentioned, we're going to hear from five teams who are working in climate tech in ANZ they're going to share more about their stories, um, five-minute bursts each, and then we'll share a little bit about um, how you can uh, learn more about this, this initiative and these sets of initiatives. If you're not already aware, um, Holland IQ, um, we are a global impact intelligence platform supporting governments, institutions, firms, and investors around the world. We power decisions that matter, focusing on education, healthcare, and climate. We're an enterprise SaaS platform based out of New York with teams in Sydney, Oxford, Bangalore, Rio de Janeiro. We're incredibly lucky to have some amazing customers from IFC World Bank, Gates Foundation, big global investors, global education institutions and technology giants, um, to name a few as part of that. Um, how did we get here? We're on a mission to map the future of climate technology. Holland AQ and Climate Salad, most specifically Mick and I over a cup of coffee at some point uh, mid COVID decided it was it was time to kind of team up and really map the most promising climate tech startups around the world and to do so in the lead up to the COP meeting the 26th meeting um, which as you're all aware is is in November we followed a process we'll talk a little bit about today we developed a bit of a prototype to get us started this is the first of about 10 regional deep dives next week we will deep dive into Southeast Asia and South Asia East Asia, China. The following week, we'll look at the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, we'll look at Sub-Saharan Africa. We'll look at Nordic, Baltic, Europe, and then finally North America. Uh, all of that work and analysis will go towards building this open source taxonomy that we've set out to announce as part of the Cl Cl Global Climate Tech 1000 um, as part of in the lead up to and perhaps at the very last minute before COP26. Before we jump into any of that, though, I want to hand over to Mick to share what Mick is seeing a little bit more about climate salad as well. Over to you, Mick. Thanks, Patrick. Really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to start. I know uh, Holland and I keep very, very global, but I do want to bring uh, back and do an acknowledgement of country. Um, so I begin today by acknowledging the traditional custodians and owners of the land which we all meet today uh, and pay my respects to elders past, present um, and emerging. So uh thanks uh, patrick just want to do a quick intro um the decks disappeared there patrick but i can jump in for quick, really quickly so i just want a quick introduction to, to climate salad um it came about as a, as a way for me to help uh, participate in the ecosystem and start um helping climate tech companies grow um start initially as a as a blog and then it's morphed into a community uh, which i'm really really excited about uh, our mission is to uh, have a huge impact huge positive impact on changing the environment, take a whole lot of greenhouse gases out of the environment. Um, and our, the way to do that is we want to help a thousand climate tech companies reach their global potential. And we, we do this by helping them get customers, team members and, and investment. What we actually do practically on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, we have three main areas. 
One is for co-founders. We have a, a private Slack community where we put them in small groups. We run private events, give them one-on-one -on -one support, uh, give them a job board, uh, anything to help them um, keep doing what they're doing. There's a little picture there of yeah, Yasmin getting um, some pitch coaching from Alan Jones. Uh, we also have the public site, and this is where we're trying to help everybody get involved in climate technologies and the climate uh, movement. Um, we put up content, we share news and reviews, we, we can find jobs to get involved and, and get into the space, join great companies. Uh, we publish free tools and there's a newsletter and a lot of public events, so we share a lot of content there. So that's our way to help everybody uh, get involved and start participating. Um, and the third group is with the investors. Um, we, we obviously know that... Um, and we want to be growing good businesses and some of that re sometimes requires good support from investors. Great to see people like um, Matthew Pry from Tenacious Ventures in the audience here today. Um, and we, for, with the investors, we help them just connect with each other, support each other through um, understanding this new uh, big space. We run some private events where they can uh, understand, again, some of these new sectors, give them data and news. Um, and that's invite only, but it's um, this is the first map we've done and we've had great feedback already. Um, and, um, and uh, yeah, it's been amazing to see the, this community come together. So they're the, they're the three big parts. Um, and, again, so I just encourage you, if you can, jump in, um, join. There's a join button at the top of the page, subscribe to the newsletter, and tell other people passionate about climate uh, technologies to, to uh, join the climate sale community. Now, what are we seeing out there in the marketplace? And I've been really frank here. Um, I've been involved in tech for a very long time but um, have been only working in climate technology for five years lightly and, and a year very, very deeply. Uh, but it's been an amazing year and I've been really excited by um, how much this is, has grown. Um, and there's, there's three big themes that I've seen. Um, the first is lots and lots of purpose and, and, and really mission-driven businesses that are looking to both create successful companies but also have a really big positive uh, impact on the world. And this is in a couple of areas. You'll see today a couple of the, the co-founders, uh, which is great. Uh, and that, that we've got people who are starting companies, joining companies. Uh, and and we, there's a big desire for people to contribute into this area, uh, which is really, really exciting. There's also good support around that in terms of um, climate scientists, researchers, uh, people like Michael Molitor, who's been amazing at Climate Salad, helping a lot of companies. Um, people like Michael and others um, coming in to, to try to beat this intersection of entrepreneurship climate and technology, and which is, uh, has been amazing. The other big change, obviously, we've seen is the investment capital. Um, I think we had, the, we had a big clean tech boom. Um, we, we had a lot of progress with wind and solar, um, but um, we've now morphed that to a bigger opportunity around climate. Um, and there's been lots of capital coming in. And, and again, great um, investors who have been able to funnel that capital down into good companies. Um, and I think the other thing we have seen is actually an improvement in, uh, in policy. Whilst we've got a lot of work to go in some areas, it's been great, I think, to see um, at various levels of government and around the world, uh, lots of uh, people committing to the, the important uh, purpose and mission around climate. Um, but one thing we also have seen around this is the breadth of it. Um, you know, it's the kind of more in my life has been more um, SaaS, e-commerce, apps and IoT, uh, but certainly climate grows much broader than that. And you'll see that today in terms of uh, go terror with um, waste eating maggots, uh, flood map in terms of solving major problems around flooding um, and uh, electric boats. There's a re there are really complex things we are doing here with a lot of these businesses. Um, and and that, that is wonderful in terms of the opportunity, but also just means actually there's complexity in how we, how we work together, how we help these businesses and how we take them to full scale. I see that both as a, as a bit of a challenge, but also as an opportunity. Um, and and that, that is the, re the real key here is that there are, there are infrastructure challenges around this. There's a, there's a lot of things that we are building around which are forming as we grow these companies, just the fundamentals around the cost of carbon, um, it, these energy networks and as they're changing, the big incumbents and how they're dealing with this big change. Um, there, there, there is a lot of complexity. And, and whilst I'm sometimes anxious about the environmental impacts we're going to see, uh, I am optimistic that the, the amount of good people working on these challenges in all different ways, collaborating, running companies, working together and uh, growing them, uh, I feel really optimistic that um, whilst we've got work to do in the short term, you know, I hope that we'll, you know, two or three years from now, we'll see some of the fruits of those actually start to scale out. Um, so that's it for me. I just want to have a big thank you again to anyone here who's committed to this space. 
um, like I have. I think there's um, there's a really really big opportunity um, to both create um, amazing businesses and lots of jobs, as well as have great impact. Um, and it, it is really going to take a big village to do that. It, there's no single answer. Um, it takes all of us. And I'm just really it's been amazingly energizing in a in a in a tough couple of years around COVID that. Um, that there's good people are banding together to solve some of these big problems. So thank you, especially the co-founders and team who are jumping in um, and, and doing the hard job. Uh, I really appreciate it. And, and a huge thanks as well to Hole and IQ. It did take about a year of badgering um, Patrick and Marie and the team to say that how, bi how big an opportunity was for climate. And I just want to say that what, what they've been able to do in, in education and learning in terms of um, understanding this complex industry, um, which has a huge impact and positive role to play in the world. Um, I, th this is a first version and, and there's a lot of things we can do better here. And I'm really excited about um, what Whole and IQ is going to be able to do for the climate tech space over the next few years. So um, huge thanks as, as well to, to Patrick and Marie and the team. And I'm um, really excited to see uh, this 50 expanded out to 100. Thanks, Patrick. Thanks so much, Mick. Uh, great words, great work. And uh, all, of your, all of your work is an inspiration for, for us as well. So let's zoom out just a little bit before we get stuck into the 100 and hear from these teams. Um, part of this initiative is is developing an open source taxonomy for the future of climate technology, which is 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 a mean is a mean feat. Um, why why would we want to do this? We want to understand at a granular level where we're seeing solutions, where we're seeing innovation. What is the velocity of formation, of funding, of growth? Where is their traction? Where is their momentum? Where are their gaps? Uh, where are the gaps compared to the challenges that we're and the problems that we're trying to solve and we're facing? Where are we underweight? Where is there white space? Um, and then also on the academic and research side, we've heard a lot of use cases around where might new science and technology find a commercial market? Where are there commercial opportunities to apply new novel uh, science and technology that can achieve financial self-sustainability as well? First task there is defining what is climate tech. And we've really taken a leaf out of the uh, EU's taxonomy for uh, investing in, in sustainable activities. We've made some slight modifications, but our definition, our working definition, because as Mick said, this is version zero, version one of a, of a long journey. Um, but we've defined that as economic activities that make a substantial contribution to climate change mitigation or adaptation and are the product of new technology or scientific knowledge. Sounds great, but actually very hard to apply across thousands and thousands of companies around the world. Another consideration, of course, is whether the organization is uh, performing the economic activity, the direct impact themselves, or whether they are an enabling, an enabler to that activity. We've seen um, a lot of work in this space, which is fantastic, as, as Mick said, I mean, it's just overwhelming the amount of focus on climate right now. On the left, you'd all be familiar last year, I think it was earlier this year, it's, it's all a blur, PwC's State of Climate Tech report, which was a great contribution in terms of helping to start to find and put some markers down about what we meant when we all said the word climate technology. And on the right-hand side, if you're familiar, is the EU Taxonomy for Sustainable Activities, which is just an incredible piece of work, but it literally has thousands of individual segments that you could choose from as part of that. Um, what we did as part of the Alpha prototype was we used our own tech. Every dot here is a company working in climate tech. Uh, we like to start with a data-driven approach that isn't necessarily encumbered by the traditional rules of, of industry to see how it organically starts to expand. But of course, uh, machines can only go so far. We need humans with expertise and with insight in able to interpret that. Massive challenges with taxonomies. We want them to be data-driven. Consultants want them to be messy, that is mutually exclusive, collectively exhaustive, that entrepreneurs know it's messy, it's hybrid, it's overlapping, it's borrowing pieces from everywhere. We want to make sure there's balance in the taxonomy. We want to balance these strong, large, high growth incumbent categories and we want to make space for those emerging new and we think will be quite important uh too and finally there's the balance of stability is inherently uh we love iteration we love rapid um and we love continuous improvement but taxonomies are about measuring things over time and so we need to 
have a level of stability and continuity as part of that journey as well. Um, at the end of this session, um, if you'd like to hang around, uh, this is literally a snapshot of version 0 0.001112 or something. Um, this is a work in progress that we are building throughout this process of launching the 50s and 100s around the world. Uh, what we're trying to do is make a coherent structure that we can analyze our climate technology through. And again, if you think about any one of these tiles, double clicking on it to understand what's underneath it, how it's performing over time. And then of course, map this to the actual challenges we're facing uh, with the climate um, over time as well. Just um, just want to really jump Go in, mate. Patrick, around the, um, the, the fact that this is a beta and the fact that there is... Um, there's a lot to learn in all these areas. Um, and I, I know there's going to be lots of companies that didn't make the final 100. I know you're going to touch onto that, but I really want to make sure we know that this is not about the best 100 or the only 100. Um, it's just about 100, which which the a group of reviewers found representative of the potential. Um, and um, and it's it needs more work. And there is it needs more than 100 companies to succeed in this and, and to do well. Um, I just want to make sure this is not a, a in, or, or in or out mutually exclusive in terms of you uh, being good companies. So just want to put that caveat out there before we go much further. Yeah, good call, Mick. It's great. So so that's a great entree to you know what were the what were the criteria we looked at as part of this this cohort. Um, age was important. We wanted to make sure that we were shining a light on younger organisations, organisations generally younger than 10 years, those that, that perhaps need a light shone on them more than others. Of course, geography for Australia and New Zealand, headquartered or predominantly focused on the region. We're focused on startups, which is kind of a problematic in itself in climate technology, as Mick had talked about from e-commerce. Like, it actually doesn't translate well or perfectly in climate technology when you have a lot of academically led scientifically led innovation that's ta perhaps taking a different route the intention however is that as a young organization that is not yet controlled a subsidiary um or a or an, or an asset if you like as well it's intended to exclude project finance large asset management example like wind farms this is not what we've intended here and standard exclusions are listed companies, private equity sponsored companies and, and mature incumbents as well, who are, again, an important part of the ecosystem, but not the focus of this, this work um, here as well. The criteria that we applied, mix right. Um, this is a representative sample, but we wanted it to be a really good representative sample. So we have bias towards organisations that are part of a, a high quality market, have a quality product that is unique have a team that has expertise and diversity, have demonstrated the ability to secure the financial resources to go on and succeed and achieve self-sustainability and have achieved momentum as well, positive changes in their velocity and their impact over time. Um, as Mick said, and the next slide is is actually the 100, there, the, the great part about going from 50 to 100 was the problem that we were faced with, which was there were literally 500 plus awesome teams um, and it's a great problem to have when you're trying to work out which 100 of those hundreds um, to represent as part of this. But without um, further ado, this is the 2021 Australian New Zealand Climate Tech 100. I'm just going to voice over and ask Mick for your observations while yeah. you're soaking that up. But you can see, and we'll jump through here, a bit of the emerging taxonomy that we've used. Uh, again, not perfect, will absolutely change over time. Representative mostly on the left-hand side of energy from renewables to uh, alternative sources, batteries and storage, the network plays, mobility and transport's huge, carbon risk data and finance features enormously, the environment and nature-based solutions, industry from advanced materials and sustainable packaging through to agri-food, which was tricky about which parts of ag tech are incorporated as part of the definition of climate tech. So let me stop there, Mick. I'd love to hear yeah. your take on just I, soaking this up. Such um, combinations of excitement and also trepidation on this because um, it, it was at least 30 to 40 laps of this we did in terms of trying to understand how to, how to represent this. Because the goal is 
not to be, as you said, exactly data driven to the point of useless, uselessness. Um, the, the goal is to, sh is to show there's a good breadth, there's lots of good companies at various stages. Um, and as you said, we've got over 500 companies we found um, and, and that blew me away. A, a lot of people have said to me over the last year, well, I meet climate tech, but sure, is, is there enough good companies here? And I just want to show this to them and say, this is only the tip of the iceberg. There's another 400 more, probably 500, 600 more under the surface who are doing amazing things. Um, and, 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 that, um, so, and that's really important to know. And, and also how you break it up. The goal is to, gain, is to get people who are not deep in this space to have some access and understanding of it. So definitely energy is really clear. Mobility and transport is clear. But then you start to look at like companies like Bright who are doing big things and allowing lots of um, um, improvements around renewable energy applications and installations, but they're, they're a finance company. Like what's the tech in that? Um, so there, it, it was really complex. But um, again, if you, if you stop trying to overanalyze it and make it perfect, I think you just get and say, wow, great first start, great to see this batch, great to know there's even more, um, and, um, and let's, let's keep going. All right, we're going to jump into just a couple of cuts and uh, I'm going to bring our first um, speaker on to share a little bit more. Let's actually get into the detail. But in terms of representation, about 11% of the companies were from New Zealand. That's ish from a GDP share perspective. On the right hand side, you can see 13 of these companies were founded since the start of COVID. And I'm pretty sure Cecil fits into that bucket, um, Alex as well, which is which is an exciting way to start off. Half of the companies in the in the uh, four years before that, and generally less than than ten years old. Um, what's fascinating, Mick touched on this: is this is not like an e-commerce map of um, enterprise SaaS uh, or B two C SaaS. You can see here, sixty three percent of this cohort actually have a physical product, um, and and that's really different to a lot of uh, fintech ed tech, whatever tech, this is a really unique and sophisticated um, space as part of this as well. And then here you can see the breakup of this emerging taxonomy. Obviously, this a pie chart is only as good as the, the parts and these parts are emerging. But it was interesting to note, you know, a very strong representation in the environment. Again, you know, Cecil's a great lead off in that respect. Um, Agri-food, I wasn't surprised given how strong relatively the Australian and New Zealand economies are in agriculture. Um, you'd expect to see really strong representation there. And then well, a great Patrick, just on that, in terms of agri-food, yes, but agri-tech, like I think, um, yeah. and again, with, with agri-tech, uh, agri-digital and um, has really grown in Australia. I think the, the fact that it's really elevated the technology and really driving it both at satellite level and also soil level, like literally grassroots level, is, is actually really exciting to see such strength. Yeah, absolutely. Look, I think that's it from us. Let's hear from these five teams. Kicking us off is Alex Logan, co-founder of Cecil. Thanks, Patrick. Thanks, Mick. Great introduction. So, yeah, everyone, my name's Alex, and I'm a co-founder of Cecil, along with Rory. We've been working together for the last four years in different capacities, and yeah, we come from a background of solving problems as engineers, designers, product builders, and we have a really strong hypothesis that collaboration and empowering teams will help us restore land ecosystems at scale. And when we look at um, in the next 10 years, what we envisioned, envisioned is, um, is a world, um, a global natural capital market that has restored 4 billion hectares of land and has been financed by hundreds of billions of dollars. And there's two really important things about this, this vision. We require a diverse range of land restoration projects across agriculture, forestry, peatlands and wetlands around the world. And we need this market to operate in line with all other financial capital markets in the world. So we need standardized and transparent hosting and assessment of global protocols. We need established accounting frameworks that deliver investment quality market documentation. And we need a consistent and independent verification process. And look, today, the most mature market in natural capital is probably carbon. And carbon markets have been around since the early 2000s. They've ridden the waves of financial crises, more recently, public mistrust and jurisdictional changes. And this has led to it being a pretty nascent market. But the tide is changing. And we're also seeing not just this market um, move out of being nascent, but also move into a bigger natural capital market. 
So every day there's a couple of factors to this. And every day we hear of another company or government committing to 2030. And this is leading to an increase in market size. So supply is expected to 10x over the next decade. And just last month, we're seeing the increase in price. So the highest prices in Australia for a ton of carbon is now over $25. So this shift is also driving new expectations beyond sequestration of carbon dioxide and towards a broad range of ecosystem services delivered through these projects. So water quality, biodiversity is starting to be valued and quantified in a, in a meaningful way. And this demand is also shifting offsets away from what's typically been generated in the past, industry, waste and renewable projects towards nature-based solutions and demand, And this is demanded by their, their additional co-benefits. But despite all of this momentum, the current market infrastructure lacks integrity. There's fragmented, to, the, the fragmented supply participation is liable to, to high costs, manual workarounds and a lot of potential measurement errors. Investment and market guidelines lack transparency and regulatory oversight. So when you go into, um, and, and just to give you a sense of the market players at the moment, this value chain shows the supply and demand aspects of the market right now. And at Cecil, we've started by supporting the source of the projects to enable high quality supply. So much like in construction, you can think about this as there are project developers who manage the day-to-day -day administration of a project. They work with uh, landholders to originate these projects through to the facilitation of purchase agreements with intermediaries or directly to buyers. And to continue this, this, uh, this sort of construction analog, what we see Cecil as a solution is the Aconex for natural capital. So our platform enables transparent, standardized collaboration between all market participants. So for project originators, we allow projects to be managed in one place reducing the need for all of the hacks and workarounds that exist today that involve spreadsheets, reporting systems in fragmented places, and important integrations with geospatial platforms. For investors, we can de-risk capital investments into nature with direct access into historical and real-time records on project performance. And then for governance bodies and verifiers, we can review detailed project activity history, we can have an auditable track record and standardized data protocols to assist with that ongoing compliance and regulation. So today we're a pretty early stage company. We launched our product in June uh, this year and we've got four incredible customers across Australia, the UK and Europe. Uh, we now have over a thousand projects on the platform. It's growing every single day. This covers over a million hectares. So well and truly on our way to getting to that 4 billion hectares of, of restoration. And we're always building our team to help others restore land ecosystems. So thanks for the chance for giving, uh, for, for having me as part of this group. And uh, hopefully that's a good overview. That's awesome, Alex. Alex, what, thanks, Alex. like it really wasn't that long ago since you guys got started, just really quickly while Olympia is yeah. getting, getting set up. What um like what is what surprised you compared to as you started the journey to to where you are today? What is it, or is there anything that, that you've seen a little bit differently? Yeah, look, I think Rory and I started this journey. I think we've got actually got a good image that we sometimes use where we're sitting down at dinner and we have a number of different beer bottles sitting in front of us, and we say that that was almost the early iteration of us mapping out the market. Uh, but I think. What we've really been encouraged by is that this market isn't going to exist with an end-to-end -end solution necessarily. So we see a real importance behind us working with different teams, different data providers in a really collaborative way that's going to get us to the end result, which is um, what everyone needs, which is restoration of these land ecosystems. So I think we've been buoyed by the fact with the partners, the customers that we've found in the last 12 months, but then also the people that we see massive opportunities to partner with in the future. That's awesome. Hey, Alex, thanks so much for joining us. Congrats on the success so far. Cheers. All right, moving on to Olympia Yaga, CEO at GoTerra. Olympia, thanks so much for joining us. Can't wait to hear this story. How are you, everyone? Uh, it's great to be here. Thank you so much. Um, so GoTerra is waste management infrastructure that delivers a circular economy. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to... Oh, there we go. Um, and we started here with our problem and the vision of what we could do better. The, the biggest and most challenging thing to facing agriculture today is that we are in climate crisis and we are also facing sort of broken food systems. And the two are working off each other to make 
um, making more food more difficult and also getting that food into the hands of people that need it um, much harder. And so we're looking at a 2050 where we won't be able to produce enough protein which is how I started GoTerra with the idea of if we can just use insects to create protein, then we will have solved some problems and we can go from there. But the bigger issue comes when you understand food waste. So we've all seen the you know, piles of food waste sitting outside or large tomato piles or all these bananas that are going to waste. But the reality is that that's actually just wasted food. It's not food waste. Food waste solutions tend to have to be far away from metropolitan areas. They can't be close to humanity. Nobody wants to smell it. Um, landfills are expensive and there's very few alternatives. And then, of course, you've got this challenge around the capital infrastructure requirements to service a metropolitan are incredibly different to the capital infrastructures required to service a regional community. But that doesn't mean that both don't need um, the, the service to be provided. So we looked at this problem and thought, okay, insects will eat food waste, but food waste isn't in large piles waiting for us to access it. It's actually in very disparate and spread out, and sometimes it's even seasonal. So how can we create a more modular approach that removes the capital burden and recreate the opportunity of managing waste by leveraging those insects a lot closer to home? So what I thought about, it, it's like, this is an intensive farming system. I can build a big factory and put a lot of maggots in there and we can ship a bunch of food waste to it and that will equal protein. But what it will also do is recreate the same logistics and cost problems that you see with intensive farming today and with landfill. So our whole vision is about changing the way we manage waste and make protein without disrupting the status quo. So people feel like they're doing the same thing, but we've completely changed the mechanics behind it. So we ended up coming back to this idea around, okay, now we have this technology that we think will deliver this solution. What does it mean to send it out into market? And I think when we're, as a climate startup, one of the things that's super important for us and, and we think is important when we're considering climate is that you've got to not solve today's climate crisis. Mm -hmm. You have to actually be solving for tomorrow's uh, climate crisis and the inevitability of the challenges that we're going to face. And so we think about that when we look at waste. Today, a lot of the easy stuff to get hold of is non-scalable revenue. It will not exist as wasted food in the future. It will have value. And so we need to be sitting down the bottom of this pyramid dealing with the stuff that has low value, can't be valorized easily, and is difficult to manage. And to do that, we've built this technology, which is an, a big industrial robot. She's not pretty on the outside, but I tell you, the inside is glorious. Um, she's a fully autonomous waste management machine that can have manage five tonnes of waste throughput per day. Um, she accepts and receives waste in the same way that a normal compactor does in any other setting. Um, bin lifter into macerator into hopper and then the machine understands that it needs to feed itself every day and will manage them and control the environment for the insects that this machine has reduced transport logistics from every day or every other day for waste to every 12 days we are not moving the waste for this machine this one's actually on site in darling harbour in sydney um, so this food waste travels zero miles um, and then the insects that are coming from it are valorized into livestock feed or dog food and the, and the frass is going to farming. So you've got this absolute valorization of a very low value product in the center of, of Sydney um, and with a capex that creates true affordability for this process. When we think about how this looks for um, you know, the world with what MIBs look like. In, um, now we have the ability to be on site for two to five tonnes of waste per day, or we can create these logistically opportunistic locations by stacking these units in, in sort of random places like waste receival um, facilities, on landfill, etc. So 
high, low, high volume clients can have one on site, low volume clients can have aggregated waste collected and taken back to a singular site. And so now we've, we can be all things to all people with this technology. Um, and it looks like this. So you'll have your clients that want an, an on-site solution, uh, lend lease, um, and your bigger um, sort of DCs for you know, McDonald's and Woolworths, and then through to aggregator clients like our um, count, city councils and waste distributors. So for us, it's about moving forward and managing as much waste as we can with as many maggots as possible and continuing to, to live the, the dream. So looking forward to the next chapter for sure. Very cool, Olympia. Really yeah. cool. I, I think uh, I, I think she looks awesome. <laughs> I mean, I'm She's excited. beautiful. She's a bit oh, lovely. <laughs> very, very impressive. Hey, thanks so much for joining us. Super impressive the work you're doing. Um, we'll be keeping tabs for sure. Thanks, thanks guys. Much. Ciao. All right, introducing Juliet Murphy. Juliet's from Floodmap. Juliet, tell us tell us more. Thanks so much, Patrick, and thanks, Mick, for having me. And, and thanks, Olympia, for that incredible presentation, that uh, words of wisdom that we have to solve the problems not of today, but the problems of tomorrow that and the trends. And that rang so true for me. So, yeah, love, love what you're doing. So uh, I'm Juliet Murphy. I'm the CEO and co-founder at FloodMap. Uh, we are building real-time scalable flood forecasting and real-time flood mapping for a safer future. So our whole aim is to prevent damage and... Uh, improve safety from flooding. So let me walk you through. Um, in the climate emergency we find ourselves in, we've got waters that are, oceans that are warming, more significant precipitation events. We haven't seen intensities like this before. Flooding is becoming more frequent, more severe each year. Losses are astronomical. Loss of life is astronomical. And they're climbing at an alarming rate. So just a quick look at the stats. 1.74 billion people are affected by flooding annually, uh, at least 96 billion in direct flood damages, um, terrifyingly more if you factor in the flooding caused by tropical cyclone and hurricanes. Um, and just a quick snapshot at, at the US, 95% of homeowners are uninsured, so we're just not prepared for what is to come. And the scary part is that a lot of flood damage is preventable. So the World Bank has done research to show that at least 35%, up to 60% of flood damage is preventable with the right warning system. So China, classic example, 17.2 billion in damages. A lot of that was auto vehicles. Cars have wheels, we can move them. It's just that people don't know that they're at risk. And, and this is the reason why so it's really that a lack of flood intelligence leads to inaction. We live in a world where as individuals, we see Uber coming to our door with a pizza, but when it's a natural disaster, we're left in the dark with these state level broad warnings um, and flood heights that are meaningless to, to the average person or the asset owner. Um, and I'll spare you the big kind of technical um, flood hydrology and hydraulics lesson, but it's basically because the models used today for mapping of a flood hazard area, like the one in 100, simply can't be run in real time to deliver that location specific intelligence. We've really hit the barriers of what's computationally possible. Um, but flood map, we're, we're tackling this problem and our bold global vision is a world in which we reduce the human and economic toll of flooding to zero. So we've developed a groundbreaking model um, focused on real-time flood intelligence. And the way at which that works is we're ingesting 25,000 plus gauges, terabytes of data every hour. We've stripped out a lot of the, the physics-based computational complexity and replaced that with big data, machine learning and AI. So we're getting run speeds 100,000 times greater than traditional engineering models, which means that basically we're able to integrate to mapping services to deliver detailed street level, property level mapping and flood forecasts at a, a nationally scalable uh, scale. So we've deployed 35,000 of these models across the continental US already. Um, and we, we saw, with this modeling technology source, our three different products, forecast, nowcast and postcast, which as the name suggests, help our customers prepare for respond to and recover from disasters so for example with forecast with that asset level 
location data, you're able to know to put sandbags or flood barriers up at your site or move your car. So to show you, you know, some successful case studies of the technology working in action, really exciting. In the State Disaster Coordination Centre earlier this year, um, the Queensland Fire and Emergency Services had a warning from the Bureau that the flood height would reach between 8 metres and 14 metres, but they need to know which houses do we evacuate. And so we solved that problem with flood map forecasts integrated into their spatial system. They were able to export an exact list of properties impacted and evacuate people 24 hours ahead of the flood, um, which is to get this kind of feedback when our vision is to improve safety and we're, we're saving lives just means the world to the team to, to get that outcome. Um, and as another use case, we're plugging it into ways in uh, Virginia, um, in the Hampton Roads area on the East Coast. So this is a community that suffers from flooding every month. Um, nuisance flooding. And so we're delivering real time street level flood models, which are then predicting road closures and going into ways as road hazards to um, be used by the algorithms to route traffic around flooded roads in real time. So really exciting stuff. Um, thanks so much for having me and, and look forward to connecting with all of you doing incredible work in this space. Thanks, Juliet. So, so super smart for such yeah. a such a big problem it's just it's something you do see from time to time like as a general consumer but just don't appreciate how, how massive it is congrats on all the success so far um no doubt you guys are going um up and up and onwards and thanks for joining us julia thanks so much awesome all right moving on to bex rempel from zero jet bex tell us all about zero jet Hey guys, um, yeah, thanks thanks for having me today. Um, my name is Bex Rumpel and I'm the CEO and co-founder of ZeroJet. So we make electric jet propulsion systems for small boats and tenders. So in short, basically, we make boats electric. And first you might be wondering how on earth I ended up as the CEO of an electric vehicle company. Well, my co-founder and I started out building high powered electric jet boards and we spent a couple of years bootstrapping and ended up building the world's fastest jet board. Uh, it went 70 kilometers an hour and it was pretty insane. So when we, we went out to talk to investors and raise capital for it, everyone was so impressed that we could pack that much power into such a tiny space. And they said, why don't you put it into boats? And it's something we had thought about, um, but we finally went out and started talking to boat builders and the feedback was incredible. So everyone we spoke to said, yep, they've got customers asking for electric solutions um, and nothing to offer them. So it was an obvious decision for us to pivot the business at that time, um, as not only was it a much bigger commercial opportunity, but also a chance to make a much bigger impact in the world. Because what most people don't realize is that small combustion outboards, which you would normally find on the back of a small boat, are disproportionately harmful to the environment. So they're actually 150 times worse um, in more nitrous oxide and hydrocarbon emissions than a car. And this is because small outboards don't have those fancy exhaust systems and catalytic converters like what cars do. And most people know um, that small two strokes are bad, but in fact, small four stroke outboards are still incredibly harmful for the environment. You can also think of it this way, that just one tank of gas burned in a 20 horsepower four stroke produces the same amount of cancer causing pollution as driving your car for an entire year. So our target is to replace 10,000 combustion engines over the next five years, equal to removing one and a half million cars off the road. So we have developed a small and compact electric jet propulsion system, which is modular, and it easily integrates with a variety of small boats up to four meters. So we are not building our own boats, rather we are partnering with leading boat manufacturers around the world so that they can electrify their range of boats. And this will also allow us to scale much faster. Our system is currently suited to tenders between three and four meters. Um, but we're also working on a higher voltage system, which will be suited for boats up to five meters and six meters. And so why, why jet propulsion and not an outboard? Well, tenders are often used to access shallow water and a jet is much more suited to this since there's no exposed propeller to hit rocks or reef. 
a jet is also much safer as it's very common for people to get cut up while swimming in the water next to an outboard, which could happen after your wakeboarding or foiling behind a boat. And now traditionally jets have been powered by large combustion engines and they required very high horsepower, which is why you don't see very many small jet power tenders. But because we have developed a lightweight and compact system, which is suited to small boats, this opens up a completely new market. So we are really rethinking electric boating from the ground up. Our jets are 85% efficient compared to 50% propeller efficiency. And our jets are specifically designed for electric motors, which produce a lot of torque at low RPM, whereas combustion engines can only produce torque at higher RPM. So currently electric propulsion makes up just under 2% of marine sales, but this is changing really quickly. The industry is in its infancy. Regulations are changing all around the world. Amsterdam has banned all combustion engine boats by its, in its canals by 2025. And there are many zero emission zones established in rivers and lakes across North America and Europe. So that's us. We make a turnkey system for boat builders that they can use to electrify their product range and take their company into the future. We want to enable thousands of boat builders globally to offer electric boats as an option for their customers, ultimately powering over a million boats worldwide. So impressive, Bex. I cannot get that picture out of my head of the outboard with like, that 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 stat is amazing. 50 cars, yeah. And the impact that you can immediately see that you can have. And I love the journey from, you know, product one through to where you are today. It's super impressive, super impressive. Hey, thanks for, thanks for joining us. Thanks for sharing a little bit about Zero Jet. I've learned a ton today and, um, and congrats. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thanks, Bex. All right. Our final speaker, Camille Sokuclair from Bloom Impact Investing. Camille, let us have it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much and um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Camille and I'm the founder of Bloom Impact Investing. So Blue Impact Investing has a mission to make climate impact investing easy and accessible to all Australians. Why do we do this? Because today the world needs to invest a total of 131 trillion um, between now and 2050 uh, to solve, um, not even to solve climate change, to avoid the most catastrophic damage from it. Um, but green investing is not only a must, it is also a huge opportunity. And this is the part I love the most um, about Bloom. In Australia alone, um, the clean tech index measured by Deloitte uh, tracking the mid cap companies has been outperforming the SX200 for six years in a row. So there's some massive returns to be made as well. And fossil fuels on the other end um, were the worst performing sector in the ASX over the last decade. Uh, we don't often talk about it because it's hidden into the ASX 200, but terrible performance, get away from it. Yet today, uh, green investing is not easy or transparent for retail investors. Retail investors are uh, people like you and I, not necessarily, um, well, actually, some in the audience will be sophisticated investor, but um, I guess mum and dad's in investors. Why is it not transparent and why is it not accessible? Um, because often it requires high minimums. Um, it requires you to be a sophisticated investor or a wholesale investor. And as we all know, many ethical investment products um, are not that ethical and a lot of them are um, greenwashing. Bloom's mission is to make climate impact investing easy and accessible. We want to empower people to grow their wealth whilst combating climate change. And we want to, um, we want to take young investors on the journey because we think they will be um, the investors and in the wealth of tomorrow. Uh, they want to make a difference, but it's often too expensive, time consuming. And again, they are very conscious of greenwashing. So with, with Bloom, we've designed a simple mobile investment app where you can easily invest um, from $500 uh, in a diversified climate impact fund. So what's in the fund exactly? 
We have a mix of listed companies actively solving climate change that we select based on the best and most robust climate um, impact models from um, Project Drawdown and Climate Works, which you might be familiar with because we are all in that clean tech space. Uh, but we mix this with green bonds, um, green depth, and also clean energy infrastructure. So you think solar farm and wind farms, and this is one of the first fund in Australia letting um, retail investors invest in those beautiful assets. Uh, today, we are a simple mobile investment app, but we have a huge ambition. We want to be the number one um, brand and hub for everything sustainable finance. Think sustainable super, um, green lending, um, home energy efficiency, and so forth. Um, why are we different? There's a ton of apps out there. You might be familiar with a lot of trading apps already. We are the first and only one to focus on climate finance. We think it's an interesting and exciting space because we are in the middle of a lot of growth trends that are converging. Online investing is becoming mainstream. There's a strong customer demand for sustainable finance products, and there is a high growth environment and high returns for climate impact investing. We've seen um, that's something I'm sure most of you know, but we've, we've been seeing massive inflows into climate tech. Um, a, a staggering figure is 1 billion um, has been pulled into sustainable funds. Um, that's just for the first quarter, quarter of 2021. But the global sustainable universe is growing and growing every, every year. Um, and again, early 2021, it was estimated at 185 billion. Um, and again, one last um, thing that I want to leave you with, you don't have to compromise on returns when you invest in climate tech. We've seen uh, huge re returns across the globe, 24% um, across Australian public equity impact investment, um, and 117 for the 12 month performance of the, the Australian Clean Tech Index. So we're on a good trend. And I'll leave you with some also final numbers, um, some strong growth in impact investing um, globally and, uh, and in, in Australia. It's a, it's a 20. Um, impact investing used to be this small little segment. On the side, half philanthropy, half investing, but now it's real, it's big, um, 20 billion in Australia. So we are launching soon. The app will be soon available in December. You can sign up to the wait list. We would love to have people really uh, genuinely committed to climate impact to join us on our journey. So jump on our website and support us. Um, and yeah, don't hesitate to get in touch with you. Thank you so much. That's awesome. Thanks so much, Camille. Hey, best of luck with the launch. I don't think you're going to have any um, problem finding finding people who are who who want to as you have done, kind of facilitate all of us getting involved in investing in, in the future as well. So congrats on the progress to date and we'll be watching closely and thanks Thank for joining you. us. All right, we are out of time, everybody. Um, thank you so much for joining us. That was just uh, such an inspirational kind of set of um, presentations. Mick, what's your kind of takeaway? What are you thinking? <laughs> Yeah, it was great. It's been um, obviously I know a lot of those companies, um, and it, it did really show the breadth there. Uh, you've got um, Olympia with a, a machine that that houses maggots, and um, you've got um, um, you've got Camille funneling lots of money from people and showing their their personal connection to this problem, uh, and again not sacrificing um, on returns. Like people should be able to get a, a good return from that. Um, and um, um, also flood map, like what an um, Juliet's team doing an incredibly hard thing, trying to work out where water's going to go in the future. Like, but it's critical, right? And I know um, um, Juliet and the team have been doing it for years before it kind of got cool and everyone realised it was a real, real problem. And and how lucky are we that there's been this group of people have been. I'm um, just working on this for so so long. So I, I just feel really privileged to be uh, playing a very, very small role in it. Um, and it's just excited to see where we can take it. Um, because I think as one of the people in the audience, Michael Molitor, says, is that everything we do in the next two or three years uh, counts for just 10 to, to 100x what we do in 10 years. So it's really important to see we've got so many good solutions um, that are, you know, they're really hitting the market and ready to scale. Absolutely. 
Uh, Mick, if people uh, aren't familiar with Climate Salad, what should they do to kind of get yeah. it? Drop by again. We've got a, a, um, a he can share a lot of content, put a lot of tools up. Um, there's lots of different parts of the community people can participate in. So go to climatesalad.com and click the join button at the top, um, and uh, you'll find good, good ways to get involved. And uh, yeah, I'd love to keep supporting climate tech companies in Australia growing and New Zealand, of course. Awesome. And thanks, Mick. Big inspiration from us. Um, thanks so much for your work, the work that you do for the ecosystem, and the work that we do together as well. It's it's been huge and. As we mentioned, this is the first of um, a crazy, ambitious Climate Tech 1000 journey over the next few weeks. So whether you're tuned into Climate Salad or Holland IQ, we'll keep you posted as we do a lap of the world, check back in and benchmark how Australia compared to, to the rest of the world as part of that. Um, I'm going to talk about the taxonomy in, the, in, in a second. Thank you so much to all the speakers who joined us today. Congrats to the 100 Probably really importantly, as Mick mentioned and underscored, is this is a humble start of something huge. Um, we have, I am positive we've missed some incredible teams that we just haven't had the opportunity to get our arms around yet. Um, we will, don't you worry, we're coming to get you. Um, next year is going to be exciting as well. I'm going to sign off um, for now, but um, hang around in the chat if you're a climate tech taxonomy geek and you want to provide some feedback um, the chat will stay live for the next 15 minutes. I'd love to hear your most critical and insightful feedback to help iterate into V2, which we'll share with Southeast Asia next Friday and follow the loop from there. So big thanks from me. Thank you to Mick. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.